Hello, citizens of Earth, and welcome to this week's edition of Tomorrow News. Now, Ryan has so much stuff to cover with SpaceX that I'm just going to let him handle that. I've got so much stuff to cover that I've got another space flight bonanza that I'm going to handle, and Dr. Tamitha Scove is going to give us this week's space weather. And before we get started, just want to remind you, of course, that if you like what we do here at Tomorrow, don't forget to subscribe to us, like our videos, hit the notifications, and share us everywhere that you can. So let's go ahead and get this show on the road, because this is your Tomorrow News for the week of June 29th, 2020. Ryan, give me all of those SpaceX deets, dude. SpaceX were testing a tank for SN7 the other day when it sort of dumped 250,000 litres of liquid nitrogen all over Boca Chica. The team down in Boca Chica were really testing the limits of this tank as they had successfully reached 7.6 bar last week, which resulted in the tank splitting in the lower half into several pieces, leading to all the liquid nitrogen to flow out and even lifting up the tank and the stand it sat on by a considerable amount. SpaceX have also made a purchase from Boston Dynamics in the form of a spot robot. For those of you unaware with Spot, he is a four-legged robot shaped very similarly to a dog who can go places where it would be unwise of a human to go. Here you can see SpaceX's Spot robot, which they have named Zeus, going in for a look at the aftermath of the SN7 tank rupture. SN5 has also been moved from the mid-bay all the way down to the launch site for another round of testing, and possibly that one thing that I have been banging on about for the last three months, a 150 metre hop. Another update on Starship is most likely coming in September, as all the other announcements have come in September. Within the next few days, Dragon Endeavour is going to be going through a habitability test to see how easy it would be for four astronauts to live in the capsule. This includes things such as sleeping, eating and just genuinely living within the spacecraft. The earliest that Endeavour can return with both Bob and Doug on board is August the 2nd, however it will most definitely be a later date. Two Falcon 9s can currently be seen sitting on both of SpaceX's pads in Cape Canaveral, with booster B1051 in the foreground patiently waiting for its fifth flight and its younger sibling, B1060, can be seen in the background, also patiently waiting on Slick 40 for its first ever flight. If all goes to plan, these two rockets should be launching very soon, with B1060 carrying the GPS-3 SV-03 mission to orbit on June the 30th, and a date should be confirmed for Starlink 9 in the coming days. But in the meantime, it's time to go back over to Jared. Woo, that was a lot of stuff going down at SpaceX this week. So very nicely covered, Ryan. And it's very hard to believe that SpaceX was once this little itty bitty company that hadn't even made it to orbit yet. Now there is another little itty bitty company that has not made it to orbit yet that you may or may not have heard of called Relativity Space. We've actually had them on our show before and they are making some very, very big moves that may end up revolutionizing spaceflight just as much as SpaceX did. If you've never heard of Relativity Space and I can understand why you really actually should know about relativity space because they've raised an astonishing 185 million dollars tested their own 3d printed engine the aeon and they have their own rocket they're developing called the terran one and as i mentioned before we actually did interview relativity space's ceo tim ellis on tomorrow orbit 11.19 which you can watch at the link here now he used to work for spacex but he left because he felt that they weren't innovating enough. Yes, SpaceX not innovating enough in his eyes. So what's so special about relativity space? Well, it's 3D printing. And you're probably thinking, well, everybody's 3D printing their parts for their vehicles nowadays, but relativity space is doing something a little bit more different than everyone else. For one, Relativity Space has built the largest metallic 3D printer in the world, which they named Stargate. Very nice. They also have, you know, $185 million in funding, and that's one of the largest sums of startup capital, not just in spaceflight, but in the world of startups overall. Their ambitious goal of getting the Terran 1 into space resonates very, very well with others simply because they want to be able to print a Terran 1 rocket every 60 days. Yep, just order a rocket and in two months it's been fully printed out and ready for you to fly your payload, whatever it may be, up to 1,200 kilograms on that Terran 1 rocket. And really, besides having a 95% 
3D printed rocket that does so in 60 days to build. That's mind blowing. But I mean, other stuff that's mind blowing too is the fact that relativity space is actually making good on a lot of the claims that they've said they're gonna do, which is something that doesn't happen very often in new space. Now, as you can imagine, this has got the attention of companies as well, and Relativity Space just inked a sixth launch deal with Iridium to have flexible capability to place Iridium Next ground spare satellites in orbit if needed. Relativity Space is already working on Launch Complex 16 at Cape Canaveral as a launch site, but Iridium satellites are in polar orbits, and that's really difficult to justify from the Cape with a rocket as small as Terran 1. So, where are you going to go? Well, you're going to head out to sunny Southern California to a place called Vandenberg Air Force Base. Relativity Space has secured what's called right of entry to Vandenberg. That allows them to go out to a site that is called B330, which presently is a storage facility. Now, Relativity Space wants to turn that into a launch pad, and it's south of the legendary Slick 6 pad that would have launched space shuttles. and has no other pads in the trajectory a Terran 1 rocket would launch to take to polar orbit. That means that they can fly their rocket without having to worry about overflying other companies' rockets and payloads. So good on Relativity Space for making these big moves. I really hope that we can have them back on the show at some point so that way we can talk shop with them. Now, some other big moves that are happening. NASA's headquarters in Washington, D.C. has a new name this week and is bringing one of those hidden figures out to the forefront. Mary W. Jackson was a potent force at NASA in a time where someone like her was frankly not welcome. She started as a human computer at Langley in 1951 under the then National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, but she wanted to advance further in aerospace engineering. Jackson had to receive special permission to join a program that would allow her to transfer to NASA's engineering division. This was because the classes that she needed were held at a segregated school. Mary Jackson became NASA's first African-American woman engineer and worked a 25-year-long career at NASA Langley studying the aerodynamics of aircraft. Jackson joined Langley's Federal Women's Program in 1979 to encourage more women to enter STEM fields. The naming of NASA HQ is an absolutely well-deserved honor and fitting that the road that the building is on was renamed last year to Hidden Figures Way. We didn't have any launches this week. Ugh, everything got scrubbed or moved to the right. Welcome to aerospace. But we do have some launches that are coming up, including the first in our 2020 Mars launch window. Let's go ahead and take a look at our upcoming space traffic. And now for this week's space weather, here's Dr. Tamitha Scope. After calming down from a weak solar storm that grazed Earth just a couple days ago, the space weather has really quieted down. But we are seeing a little bit of activity from the new solar cycle, so that's some good news. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see we actually have an old filament that is beginning to rotate off of the sun's west limb. We were hoping this filament would erupt and give us a solar storm, but it looks like it's going to make a trip around the far side. So we're going to see and, and watch it to see whether or not it erupts on the far side or if it's going to come back around and potentially give us a solar storm in about a month or so. Now on top of that, we do have a bright region in the north just below that filament. That has been emerging. That is a new cycle active region. We also have a coronal hole that's rotating into the Earth strike zone here over the next couple days, and it could give us some small pockets of fast wind, but probably not enough to bring any aurora. Now the big story actually has been in the last day or so in the south, we've actually had a new bright region emerge, and this one has become a sunspot. Unfortunately, it's rotating off of the sun's west limb just as quickly as it has emerged, so it has not gotten the designation 2766. We were hoping that was going to happen, but it didn't. So we are going to watch this region as it rotates around the far side to see if it shows up in stereo's view in about a week or two. Now switching to our stereo view, this is stereo A, and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side. You can see there are two bright regions in Stereo's view right now. The, the one in the south, this is old region 2765. And 
it doesn't look like it's a sunspot. This was a sunspot on the Earth's uh, facing view, but now it looks like as it's rotated back into stereo's view a month later, it really has decayed quite a bit. However, this is the first time we have had a solar cycle 25 bright region survive an entire far side passage and come back into Earth view. So that's really exciting news. And then also in the north, we do have yet another small bright region. This is also a new cycle bright region, and it is firing off a few really mini flares, but you know, it's not going to be enough to bother with comms for space traffic. For more details on this week's space weather, including those new cycle bright regions and how they could affect you, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Gather around everybody, it's your second week of a dose of Jared's space flight. Yeehaw, bonanza, gather around little doggies, it's time to go a launching. Astronauts Chris Cassidy and Bob Benkin performed an extravehicular activity on June 26, continuing work on a multi-year long upgrade involving the battery system of the International Space Station. Originally running on 48 nickel hydrogen batteries, those are being replaced by 24 more potent and longer lasting lithium ion batteries. Now upgrading the ISS batteries should allow its power systems to operate smoothly well into the 2030s. There are at least four more spacewalks, all to be performed by Chris Cassidy and Bob Benkin, scheduled to replace the remaining batteries, as these are on the ends of the space station's structural trusses. Now, they are well beyond the reach of the Canada Arm, too, which means that the astronauts have to perform more of the grunt work, which slows down the amount of work that they can actually accomplish per EVA. And that means that they also have to keep more margin in case there is any contingency on an EVA. On June 25th, Virgin Galactic performed its second unpowered flight of Spaceship 2 VSS Unity over New Mexico, pushing the suborbital spacecraft into the transonic region with a top speed of Mach 0.85. There's still some tweaks left to be done to VSS Unity before powered flights begin, and Virgin Galactic has noted that they're still sitting within the regime of testing. Commercial flights are only going to begin when they are satisfied with the results of the test flights. Space Adventures, a space tourism company, has announced that they have signed on a customer to fly to the International Space Station. And of course, people have done that before, so what's the big deal? Well, this one, uh, this one's customer has also signed up to have an additional experience during that flight, a EVA. At some point during their 14-day trip to the ISS, this loaded chum will take a step out of the Russian segment and into the silent sea. And let me tell you, I'm pretty jealous, pretty immensely jealous, because I personally would love to absolutely do an EVA. NASA's upcoming double asteroid redirection test has seen its target finally be given a name. Now, it's scheduled for a launch in July of 2021. DART is going to arrive at double asteroid Didymos in October 2022. When it does, it will deploy a six unit CubeSat, which will image the impact of DART into its small moon at roughly six kilometers per second. And that small moon target is the one that now has a name, Dimorphos. I mean, Dimorphos does sound cool and all, but I kind of like the original name of it, which was Diddy Moon. Yes, Diddy Moon. <laughs> I suppose we'll now call it the moon formerly known as Diddy, or just Moon Diddy. In 2024, the European Space Agency will launch Hera, a spacecraft which will arrive at the asteroid system in 2027 to study just how much deflection occurred to the moon formerly known as Diddy due to the impact of DART. The United Kingdom has never launched anything from the Isle proper, but that is about to change because Space Hub Sutherland has obtained planning approval to begin construction of a launch site in Melness, which for us Americans, that's Northern Scotland if you'd like to hunt for it somewhere on a map. And also, if I mispronounce that, go ahead and correct me down in the comments. Orbex, a small sat launcher in the area, confirmed that they've acquired six launch contracts and have performed tests on launch systems. So there's already a customer ready to go for that launch site. In addition to that news, the British government has announced a $621 million initiative to be a part of a consortium bidding on the bankrupt OneWeb. Now, it's nice to see our friends across the pond finally getting in on the space action. To wrap up this week's news, I want to thank all of you who helped contribute to the shows of tomorrow. 
It means a lot to us here that you all contribute to make this possible. The equipment that we use, the studio space that we have, Station 204, when we get back to it, the time those of us involved in this can take to work on these shows, none of this is possible without you. So every single bit of support is appreciated. And if you'd like to help support the shows of tomorrow, head on over to youtube.com slash tmro slash join and check out all the levels and rewards you get at those levels. And hey, figure out if you kind of want to see what's going on, come join our Discord server. We have a lot of fun on there. Now, of course, subscribing, liking, setting up notifications, and sharing our videos everywhere that you can is another massive way for you to support us as well. And that's Seco for this edition of Tomorrow News. Thank you so much for stopping by. And until the next one, remember, stay healthy, stay safe, and keep exploring. And here are your upcoming launches. Gonna wait for the plane. Thank you, United Airlines Flight 2851. I appreciated having to wait for you to pass over my house.